You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 188 of the Common Scent Podcast. Today, we are discussing cannibalism. What fun. Yeah. This may immediately spark the feeling of like, ooh, one of the weird topic ones. Not as weird as you might think it would be. Yeah, certainly not the weirdest diet episode that we've talked about. No. A very common, as we will find out, feature of nature is species eating their own kind. We will be discussing what entails cannibalism, Mm -hmm. what are the varieties and the different ways we see it show up, and what causes it. You know, what are the benefits, the pros, the cons, the pressures that lead to cannibalism, and can we detect it in the fossil record, and how does it evolve? And if so, what does that mean? Yeah. Very fun. This is going to be one of those topics where a lot of the discussion is this thing, not the way you think you probably think that it is. Yeah, a lot of stereotypes and stigmas around cannibalism, but not nearly as bizarre once you actually take stock of how many organisms are doing it. It's going to be a good chat. Yes. We are discussing this because it was requested. We got requests from Ari, Hadley, and Lydia. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun to learn about. Tons of fun facts with this. Before we jump into our discussion, we have some announcements. First and foremost, we have a Patreon. This allows us to do all the cool stuff we do, and it funds us top to bottom, so thank you. And one of the ways we like to thank our patrons, not only by giving them extra goodies, extra audio and ways to hang out with us, but at certain levels, we like to shout their names out at the beginning of the episode when they have joined. So we would like to welcome Miles and TinFam from TV. Welcome and thank you to our new patrons and all of our old patrons. Absolutely. If you would like to join us there or get your name shouted out, you can find the link down in the description where you can check our Patreon out and see whether it piques your interest. (laughs) Check out director's notes, bonus content, live streams, all sorts of fun stuff that we do for our patrons. Absolutely. You can also find all sorts of other links for our stuff down there. Speaking of extra content... We have a series happening this year. Spotlight 2024 is in progress. Uh, Each episode, we're sitting down with other podcasters and science communicators to talk about podcasting and science communication. Episode two is just about to come out. And it's been a ton of fun so far, so please check that out. Take a listen to our guests this time and see if their podcast might interest you as well. That next episode comes out on April 3rd, and then the first Wednesday of each month moving forward, lots more episodes of Spotlight 2024 to come. And then the following Wednesdays in April, we have another series that is coming back this year, Silver Screen Science. I love Silver Screen Science. Yes, we are ready to talk about some more movies. This year we're doing a theme, and the theme is sharks. Ooh, it's going to be a lot of a shark month. Yes. So we will be releasing episodes of that. The last three weeks of April, and then in May, on the 5th, at 2, we'll do a Silver Screen Science live stream. That'll be a lot of fun, so check out those episodes as they come out through April. Enjoy our movie discussions. If you're on Patreon, we will have extra bonus episodes where we talk about our more thoughts, and then join us for the live stream. Absolutely. We like doing live streams. It's a thing we're trying to do more of. Yes, and we like talking about movies. We got to do that a bunch because we were just finished up ETSU Con yes, this past weekend. Convention in Johnson City. Tons of fun. We did a bunch of panels. It was a lot of fun. It went really great, as it always does. We also got to meet Aaron, who is one of our patrons and listeners, who brought us gifts. Yes, who brought us gifts, and then we lost out on some gifts because they went to some other people. Because the rest of the panel was so awesome. (laughs) Very (laughs) deserving people. (laughs) Aaron, it was great to meet you. Thank you so much for those little toys. And and mine is on my shelf with the rest of my Crocs (laughs) on the Croc shelf. I think mine currently, my little Mosasaur, is currently sitting next to Mewtwo on my (laughs) shelf in my room. A, A place of honor. ETSU Con was a ton of fun. Thank you to everyone who showed up to the panels who hung out with us, to our fellow panelists, and a special shout out to Crimson and Molly and all of the students who organized that convention. It's a ton of fun. 100%. I love getting to go. And then final announcement. This one is something kind of unexpected and awesome. 
My friend Tom, who I worked with at the aquarium when I was there, has written a book called What Does the T Stand For? About what does the T and T-Rex stand for? And it's a kid's book. It's available on Amazon. But I helped him fact check some of the things that were included. And uh, there's a little cartoon version of me in it. (laughs) And so it's very neat. So if you want to check that out, go follow the link that's in the description. I'm very happy that I'm in a kid's dino book. It's very cool. If you want to go see a little cartoon well talking about tyrannosaurs. (laughs) And it's a very cute book. It's just it's a very fun cartoony kids book. With, with T-Rex facts just yeah. sprinkled throughout the pages. It's I, it's delightful. That's great. Well, shout out to Tom and to everyone else who participated in that book. And shout out to kids and shout out to Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we can wrap up our announcements and start our first section, which is the news. Every episode, we like to gather some recent studies in paleontology, earth sciences, evolution, and similar stuff. To help us all stay up to date on what's going on in the scientific world, David, what's the news? I've got news about a weird bird. Ooh, I love weird birds. This specifically is an enantiornith from the Cretaceous period. This is one of those weird but very widespread birds in the Cretaceous. This is research by Shali Wang et al. in the journal Cretaceous Research. And if you head on over to the blog post after this, we will link to an article in Smithsonian Magazine by Tara Wu. In Antiornith birds, we have mentioned many times on the podcast, the so-called opposite birds, <laughs> were a very widespread group of birds during the Cretaceous. They are not the same lineage as our modern birds that we're familiar with today, but they were extremely successful. They came in a variety of different shapes and sizes and places that they were very diverse and successful. This study, they are called opposite birds because the structure of their shoulder joint is different. It's different. It's not like an opposite direction or anything, but it's yeah, different. Yeah, they're not actually anti-birds. Right. But they are distinct from our birds. If one of these birds collides with one, uh, our birds, they destroy it. Yeah, yeah, nothing's left. Nothing is left. <laughs> this paper describes a new species of an antiornith from the Jehol biota in northeastern China. They have named it Imparavis attenboroughi. Nice. It is named after David Attenborough, as so many scientific species names are (laughs) it dates to about 120 million years ago we talked about the jehol biota in episode 152 this new species is unusual for a number of interesting reasons for one it has no teeth okay now some of you may be thinking well birds that sure no teeth (laughs) yeah that's what that's what a bird is (laughs) and antiornith birds are typically toothy Yes. Our modern lineage of birds ancestrally lost teeth, and so it's basically toothlessness in the beaks all the way across. This is also true of some other extinct lineages of birds, but it is not true of all ancient birds. Most birds within Enantiornithes are toothy. Some of them are only partially toothy, and there are some that are edentulous, which is to say, no, they have completely lost their teeth. So far, according to this paper... All of the toothless members of this group are from the late Cretaceous. Gotcha. As old as about 70 million years ago. Imparavis is therefore, by a long shot, the oldest known toothless enantiornith. These authors also re-examine another enantiornith burn, Chiapiavis, and conclude that it was also toothless, which is starting to add up a significant list of toothless species within this group of birds which is interesting because toothlessness is for sure not as common in an antiornith birds as it is in our birds and their ancestors but this evidence is starting to build up that it might not have been as uncommon as we had expected yes this is something that is convergently evolving within these birds the authors do note that There doesn't seem to be a clear lifestyle or habit or diet within these birds that is related to the toothlessness, which is interesting because in modern birds and other theropod dinosaurs, tooth loss is typically associated with herbivory. Yes. With the shift to eating plants that there isn't strong evidence for that in these birds. So it may be that they are evolving toothlessness under different selective pressures. Yep. Yep. Which is interesting because we've talked about that 
a lot of times toothlessness in you know, our lineage of birds gets attributed to being connected with flight and whatnot, even though it could very well be more likely due to the fact that their ancestor lost teeth for some reason. Now they are all stuck with not having teeth. But another bird lineage doing this more often than we thought they were brings up a question of, okay, well, now is there some weird pressure between the two? And it may very well be that different lineages of birds evolved this similar feature for different reasons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That an Antiornis may have had a different dietary habit that benefited from toothlessness or something like that. Imparavis is also unusual because of its arm bones. In the article, I think there's a snippet of an interview with one of the authors who points out that the arm bones were one of the first things that they noticed that made them think that this was something unusual. The upper arm bones have particularly large crests on them for particularly powerful muscles, which is also something we don't see in early Cretaceous and Antiornaths. Imparavis is unusual for that. But they do compare it to some modern birds that have a similar structure, and this is seen in species that either flap very fast or have a very fast takeoff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they specifically note things like quails and pheasants, and they suggest that looking at the arm morphology and also the shape of the legs, they propose Imparavis might have been a ground foraging bird. They might have come down out of the trees or whatnot to hop around and find food on the ground, but those powerful wing muscles might have been good for making a quick escape if they needed to get up off the ground really quickly. Okay, yeah. Interesting. I am very curious to, if we can figure out any patterns as to why some groups, as, you know, especially in situations like this where you have toothed and non-toothed members and there's not a clear distinction as to what's setting them apart of... Is there some interesting lifestyle or are teeth not as big a deal for that group as we're making it? Like, what's the distinction between why some are doing it and some aren't? Neat. My next news, uh, mine does have teeth. Right. And it was noted to have lots of teeth and a very long snout because it's about a dolphin. This is the largest river dolphin yet discovered. Ooh. It is a fossil river, dol river dolphin from the proto-Amazon. You know, what used to be similar to uh, the similar area as the Amazon in the past, but not the Amazonian river dolphin. Oh. Yeah. A dolphin in the Amazon. Yeah. A river dolphin in the Amazon region, but is not Amazon river dolphins as we have today. Yes. Oh. It's related to different river dolphins. Huh. Because <laughs> dolphins are weird and whales are weird. This is research by Aldo Benitez Palomino et al. in Science Advances. And the article is by Paul Smaglick in Discover Magazine. So we talked about river dolphins in our toothed whales episode. Yes, in episode 172. There are a number of different lineages that have gone from saltwater to freshwater and become freshwater specialists. There's the famous Amazonian river dolphins. There's also Asian river dolphins and a number of other like porpoises that are at least more freshwater than a lot of their cousins. And some of them are considered freshwater morphs. This new species, which was named Pebanisto yacaruna, this is a Miocene aged dolphin from Peru, so 16 million years old. And they've said it's proto Amazonia, so the area that would become the Amazon rainforest. This river dolphin has the features of river dolphins. It has the long snout that many of them have, it has a large super orbital crest, which is associated with their high highly specialized echolocation for the murky rivers mm -hmm. of uh, freshwater habitats. So all its features suggest it's freshwater and it's found in a place where that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Where it gets interesting is that when they looked at the phylogeny of how where it falls out compared to other dolphins, it falls out more closely with the South Asian river dolphin or the Ganges river dolphins as it's also known in the group Platanista, which is a group that more broadly, you know, other cousins are full of other river dolphins in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. This was often called the river dolphin group. But it is not grouped with the Amazonian river dolphin, which is not in this group. It is its own lineage. Yes, like you said, multiple lineages of dolphins have evolved river forms. Yes. River species. This one happens to live in the same place in the past that a different lineage of river dolphins lives today. Yes. And so like the Platanissa was famous for various river dolphins and it looks like they were 
also invading the water in the Amazon. But now we have the Amazonian river dolphin. So this gives us a idea of the fossil distribution of this other group and that this place has been populated by river dolphins multiple times. It is also the largest freshwater dolphin yet known. Mm-hmm. It's estimated by length is three meters. So Ooh. this is a 10 foot river dolphin. That's big. That's big. That's getting up to bottlenose dolphin size, yeah. which is an oceanic dolphin. They said this is also useful because it highlights that there had to be ample resources in the rivers during that time sure. to support such a large dolphin. And they noted that the area of what they called the Pebas system started to shift to the more Amazonian modern system that we know around 10 million years ago. And that shift could be why we saw a shifting of dolphins, that it may have shifted out of being ideal for such a big dolphin. And then they either cleared out or died. And we got a reinvasion with the Amazonian river dolphin. And so this might give us an idea of the shifting habitat during that time. And this, this, new fossil might represent one of those shifts or one of those species lost during the shift to a more modern Amazonia. Mm -hmm. This is something that we'll see over time throughout the fossil record where multiple different groups of animals have taken turns is not the right Right. necessarily way to put it, but certain roles, certain habitats were occupied by one group and then they left and then another group came in and did the same sort of thing Yep. in sequence and succession so you can have a scenario where for a period of however many millions of years there have always been or have typically been freshwater dolphins in the amazon but it hasn't always been the same lineage of dolphins yeah which is a very interesting thing and it makes sense on one hand because dolphins have done this multiple times anyway in multiple parts of the world so it doesn't there's no reason they couldn't do it multiple times in the same place Mm -hmm. and if this place has continued to be a good place to be a river dolphin then it makes sense that it's continued to happen here very cool stuff i've got another news that is also kind of about looking at how a region has changed and characterized over time it's a little bit of a stretch this one is about an assessment and evaluation of a particular region during the age of dinosaurs and just what that part of the world was like in terms of climate conditions, local habitats, dinosaurs, and other stuff. This is research by Anthony Fiorillo et al. in the journal Geosciences, and we will link to a press release in Sci News. So a lot of the time when we are talking about news on the podcast, and those last two newses we just discussed where we found a new species of a thing, or we reevaluated a particular plant or animal or something, but... This kind of study, and we've talked about these before, a study that focuses on here's a formation in the geologic record or a region that we're just going to do a broad scale evaluation of what kind of habitat and ecosystem are we looking at and where can we go from here? Yes. This particular study is an overall assessment of a portion of the Nanushuk formation in northern Alaska. Previous research like this has explored other formations in Alaska. Alaska is a great place uh, for Cretaceous fossils, especially dinosaurs and such. Other research has focused on late Cretaceous formations around 70 million years ago or so. This one is mid-Cretaceous. There isn't a middle Cretaceous, but it is in the middle of the Cretaceous between about 94 and 113 million years ago. This makes it distinct not only in time from other formations that have been examined in Alaska, but in conditions. This is during the Cretaceous Thermal Maximum, among the warmest time periods of the Cretaceous. At this time around the world, we see evidence of rising sea levels and major shifts in plant and animal ecosystems. It's also around the time that flowering plants are taking off, so there's a whole lot of change going on at this time. Being in Alaska makes this formation an opportunity for us to understand Arctic ecosystems during this time period. Yup, yup. It's also, the authors note, around the time of early exchanges between Asia and North America. 
which is another thing Alaska often gets studied for, is interactions between these two continents. That's the corridor you travel through if you are dispersing across the continents. The Nanushuk Formation is exposed all across northern Alaska. This study specifically is looking at outcrops along a particular river, which is called the Kukpaurik River, or however that is properly pronounced, <laughs> in northwestern Alaska. And they just document a bunch of the things that are to be found there. The geologic sequences correlate to various shoreline environments, so offshore, on the shore, and terrestrial, including river plains and delta plains. There's lots of well-preserved plant materials. They report one area with standing tree trunks, like we talked about in another recent news. There are leaves and coprolites, and they spend a lot of time discussing extensive trackways in this formation. In the press release, one of the authors is quoted as describing this place as, quote, crazy rich with dinosaur footprints, <laughs> including, according to the paper, about 75 new dinosaur track sites. Wow. A bunch. This includes theropod dinosaurs and ornithischian dinosaurs. They even did a little count to compare sort of proportions. They noted that bipedal plant eaters represent more than half of the dinosaur tracks in this area, which is not terribly surprising. That's Makes sense. what they do. And they also noted that birds are particularly abundant. About 15% of the tracks are bird tracks. Oh, sounds like a tranquil place. Sounds delightful. Uh, and then some rel some smaller percentage were other theropod dinosaur yes. tracks. <laughs> so there were predators as well. And they did some carbon isotope work from fossil wood to make estimates of precipitation and found evidence of increased levels of rainfall, which is also seen around the world during the Cretaceous Thermal Maximum. All in all, this is a paper that just puts together, here's a bunch of information, what we can tell about the environments and ecosystems in this region at this time, with, it sounds like, lots of potential for future study to understand climate conditions and dispersal pathways for different groups and just the ecosystem structure of the mid-Cretaceous during a time where the world was particularly warm and ecosystems were thriving in Arctic regions. I always really appreciate these studies that just take a accounting of all the data we currently have and all of the things present within a you know, area or site or series of sites. Because, like you said, it's not describing something new as in a new fossil or a new name or like a new research technique, but it is putting things in perspective potentially and kind of gathering them all together. Yeah, this kind of analysis, these are done pretty frequently. Yes. But they don't commonly make headlines. Uh, and here on the podcast, we do try to talk about papers that are have ended up in the news somewhere so that there is a link we can send so that anybody can read instead of sending people the technical paper itself, yes. which isn't always very accessible. So we end up not talking about these kinds of papers all that often on the podcast. But this is a hallmark of especially geological studies is to take a formation or an outcrop and just put together all the detail, all the technical stuff. What can we tell? What is preserved here? What does this tell us about the ancient environment? What does this tell us about the ecosystem? That then tends to form the foundation for future studies that can then be the studies that go, hey, we looked at these trackways and we learned this about dinosaur locomotion or we found this fossil and it's a new species or so on. Yeah, well, it's kind of the study version of making sure you see the forest through the trees, <laughs> of taking a moment and going, all right, we've been studying individual sites or finds or specimens, but let's take a step out and look at all the sites that they've come from from this similar age or location mm -hmm. or stratigraphic layer or whatever it is that you're trying to do a, a, a you know, consensus of. Yeah. And in this case, literal trees. Yes, exactly. There are, there are trees. Yeah. Tree trees. <laughs> so it's I, I really appreciate these. It's it's giving that perspective, like you said, that future studies can then reference back to and use as a foundation to build off of. Yeah. This one made it into a press release probably because of the standing 
tree stumps and dinosaur footprints. Yep, yep. Because that'll get you a press release. That gets attention. Well, my next news is back to talking about a single specimen. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Those are also important. <laughs> Enough about the forest. Let's look at this tree. <laughs> Let's it's look at this super cool tree. Not a tree, what though. What kind of tree is it? It is an amphibian cousin that got named after Kermit the Frog, which is why it's been uh, getting lots of news. And it's also why Will is doing yeah, the news. <laughs> but it made me curious to look into it, and it turns out to be a pretty neat fossil. This is research. You, you have to uh, describe this <laughs> right, right. in your Kermit the Frog yes, voice. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> this is research by Calvin So. Et al. in Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society. And the article is by Jennifer Nell Wiki in Live Science. This is about not an amphibian like myself, but one of my cousins, the Timnospondyle. This is a <laughs> skull of a amphiboform, which has been grouped within the Timnospondyles, which were ancient, often called proto-amphibians. Like these are before the lineage of amphibians we recognize, but they are very amphibian-y, kind of big salamander-shaped creatures that probably had similar features, but were also notably different. Lots of them were kind of crocky. This is not a newly discovered skull. This was in the collections of the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History and was discovered by Nicholas Holton III, who was the curator of the museum at the time. I... I mm. Didn't see it which year it was in, but they were digging in the red beds of Texas, found a whole bunch of stuff. And there was evidently a quote from uh, Nicholas that was like, we can't study them all. And <laughs> a bunch of it went into the collections and this skull has been sitting in there waiting for someone to come mm -hmm. give it the attention it deserves. This is a very small skull. It's only two and a half centimeters. Oh, so this is really tiny. not very big at all. Inch long skull has big oval eye sockets and a longer snout than it, your typical Timnospondyle, or at least longer than average, potentially. Notable enough to mention. And it has enough unique features that it doesn't group with any other previously known species. One they mentioned was that the part of the skull with the animal where the eye sockets are is shorter than the snout, which made it sound like is not the typical ratio yeah. that is expected. So just a, a differently proportioned head mm -hmm. than other Temnus bundles. Enough to set it apart as a species and something notable, like a notable ratio that seems like it might be worth a uh, uh, lead to further studies or interpretations for how this uh, animal functioned. This was given the name Kermitops gratis, which was named because of those big eyes, giving it a very Kermity face. <laughs> They said it likely would have resembled a stout salamander with a longer snout, probably snapping up inverts and insects and stuff, probably predatory. They described it having cartoonishly wide eyes, thus the name, and it dates to the early Permian, so around 270 million years old. And the abstract mentioned that it, the features of this new species sync up with recent hypotheses about the evolution of modern amphibians. Okay. I didn't find a specification of what hypothesis or what suggestions that, it, but that this is evidently already being noted to fall in line or give suggestions for uh, support to recent hypotheses. So this might be further studied to try to understand how we, how our modern lineage of amphibians evolved. Excellent. Uh, specifically the neurocranium. So like the area around the brain. Yeah. That's very fun. When I think of Temnus bundles, I often think of the big ones. Yes. And it's nice to be reminded that they were also little Temnus bundles, as, the, as is the case for so many groups. Yes, they were diverse. This was a diverse group of animals. Can we get a hello, Kermitops the Temnus bundle here? <laughs> hello, Kermitops the Temnus bundle here. Fantastic. <laughs> Reporting in from the Permian. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Ah! That's two. Two impressions. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. And with that, we can wrap up the news and move on to our main topic, cannibalism, which, unfortunately for Kermit, is a thing amphibians do quite a bit. Yeah, we're going to leave Kermit <laughs> out of the rest of this discussion and keep him safe. <laughs> so let's talk about what cannibalism is and why things do it.
Cannibalism is one of those natural behaviors that can seem full of contradictions. Mm -hmm. Because by definition, cannibalism is when an individual of a species eats another member of their own species. That's it. It can take many, many forms, but that if that happens, a species eating itself... Right. Yeah. <laughs> technically cannibalism. That is cannibalism. And this can often see, and it has historically very often been seen as an anomaly or some sh- unusual occurrence in nature. Yeah, because it, it seems sort of intuitively like that's not what would benefit a species population. Exactly. It also often gets cast in a dark light. Yes. As like an wrong or something has gone wrong. Yeah, a taboo. This. Yeah, exactly. That this, sh- you know, quote unquote, shouldn't be happening. But we now understand that cannibalism is extremely widespread. It is noted in just about every major taxonomic group of animals. Mm. And it is found across many species in many environments and often in scenarios that are the normal happenings of that environment. It is not always just in times of desperation or lack of food or starvation, which is what has often been thought that you will only see cannibalism happen when animals are at dire straits Mm -hmm. and are resorting to this last ditch food source. But that's not the case. Cannibalism is actually a very normal, natural, regularly occurring part of animal life. It is notably typically more common with predators because they are already adapted to eat other animals. Yep. Makes so sense. They have the tools at hand to do that. But there are tons of herbivores, especially herbivorous insects are famous for this, of mm. they will engage in cannibalism in many different situations. So it is not a select, rare, or specialized behavior. For a long time, the scientific community had a view of cannibalism that it was rare and unlikely to happen and if it did it was probably due to unusual circumstances or detrimental to that population right like we said something has gone wrong Mm -hmm. but these views have been overturned in the last handful of decades Mm -hmm. Uh, relatively recent like the 1970s is really when research started to update on this and now we have a view that it's actually not weird really at all. Yeah, it's not an un, it's not an anomaly. It's not an unusual occurrence. Yes. Now, probably one of the reasons that some of these views were held is because cannibalism is one of those natural behaviors that does also apply to us humans. Yes. There are historical and cultural instances of cannibalism, many of which are normal to certain cultures, while to other cultures seem like a taboo is considered something you just don't do. And that view can color how we view it in nature. Absolutely. It's especially important to consider that for a long time, especially early on, science was predominantly being done by people from cultures with that cultural perspective. Exactly. Very much the same reason why for such a long time, the scientific community had a tendency to completely overlook same-sex sexual behaviors in other species. Because... They were coming from a cultural standpoint that had a particular view on that, and that clouded the the ability to understand that in other species. Yeah, they were making assumptions, why, whether subconsciously or on purpose, mm-hmm. that their views also applied to nature. Now, typically when we think of human cannibalism, it will often come to mind of like survival situations. Right. There are some famous stories yes. of that happening. And there are many historical accountings of that occurring. There are times in history and cultures where it is a normal practice in either ritualistic or often funerary, uh, funerary cannibalism Mm -hmm. of eating part of the dead is a practice that has been seen in different cultures and peoples. But there is also medical cannibalism, which was fairly common in the 17th century in Europe and where pieces of body, bone or blood were imbibed and thought to be medical uh uh, uh, have medical applications and Mm -hmm. treatments for things Uh, i saw one thing even note that executions went on the rise during that time due to the demand for body parts Uh. so like oh man it was a very normal thing during that time for those people so human cannibalism even though for many people it might seem like a rare and or or taboo or taboo thing. thing 
it has not always been in for different groups of people, just isn't that. Now, in this discussion, we will be predominantly focusing on other species. Yes. Because that saves us getting into cultural discussions and things that we are not particularly Yeah, we are not anthropologists. On. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's we won't be discussing the cultural uses of cannibalism or applications or approaches. We will be discussing it in natural animal habitats and behaviors. Yes. Which is always an important note to make mm-hmm. because we're eventually going to get into discussions of evolutionary selective pressures and benefits and things like that, which get a little dicey when we start talking about that in the context of cultures and exactly. people. We're talking about wildlife yes, from here forward. We're, and in which case, cannibalism is also going invo- to involve hunting Yes, one of a species own. Right. Which is like you were saying with human cultures, it is very often a ritualistic practice or it's a practice in nature. We see lots of wildlife where cannibalism is just part of their hunting or scavenging behaviors. Exactly. Now, one of the big questions that comes up about cannibalism is how could a species eating another member of its own species be beneficial to the population, Mm -hmm. to the species? Would that not hurt the population in general and weaken the survival of that genetic, you know, population or species in total. Right. If we're looking at a population of alligators or lions or spiders or whatever, yeah, wouldn't that be reducing the population and genetic diversity of that same species? And therefore, why is this something that is as common and persistent as it is today. Yeah. Would it not be evolved away mm-hmm. by the groups that survived because they weren't eating each other? But there are some direct benefits and indirect benefits that come. One of the direct benefits is you gain nutrition. Sure. which you're eating. Absolutely applies to situations of starvation or lack of nutritional food. Like if an animal isn't getting enough food and there are other members of its own kind around... That can be a survival mechanism. Right. And this is that classic idea of if this individual is having a hard time finding food and nutrition, it might resort to eating its own species nearby. Absolutely. There are indirect benefits, which can be the fact that this animal might be removing competition. Yeah. If there's high competition, so not just necessarily low food, but too many members of that species. Yes, often the the biggest competition comes from the animals doing the exact same thing that this animal is trying to do. Exactly. They're all going for the same resources and types of food. So if that individual eats another member, not only are they getting nutrition, they are also eliminating competition and potentially freeing up more nutrition, which can then lower cannibalism rates. Mm -hmm. And we see things kind of like this in a lot of, even mammal things like lions and such. Exactly. This is part of why it is extremely common. One of the biggest, one of the most regular things I saw mentioned for a thing that sparks cannibalistic behavior is overcrowding. Yeah. When a species becomes numerous and doesn't have enough space to spread out, they very often will start to increase their cannibalistic behavior because they are now not able to avoid one another. And it, so in some species, triggers kind of a shift in behavior mm-hmm. to now include cannibalism into day-to-day activities or feeding habits. This is extremely well documented in amphibians. Uh, tadpoles are seen to do this a ton. Oh, yeah. That tadpoles in, like, a pool of water, if the pool of water shrinks or there's just too many tadpoles for the pool of water, cannibalism will start to happen. If there's enough space often, cannibalism won't be seen at all. Mm -hmm. This is noted in like spadefoot toads uh, and wood frogs were two regular examples I saw referenced for this. One thing this might do for them is in the case where like the pool is drying with the toads, it was noted that when they started using cannibalism, the cannibals developed faster. So they could metamorphose more quickly and get out of the drying pool. And avoid getting eaten. Exactly. So sometimes it might be that cannibalism is a more efficient source of nutrition Mm -hmm. than whatever they would normally be eating and it can speed up development yeah we see we talked about a similar example in episode 154 about live birth about animals where in utero while an embryo will eat the other embryos and bolster that development of the eater in that case exactly 
And so there is the concept of like, what's the easiest way to make more toad eat toad? Yes. You got all the parts that uh, you're going to need. Exactly. Like all the same ingredients are in that other tadpole to make (laughs) more tadpole. There's also the idea that it might just vary the diet that, you know, for like things like herbivores, this came up where if various caterpillars are all eating the same food, a cannibalistic caterpillar is going to get the food that caterpillar ate. It's victim ate, but also the tissues of that caterpillar right, the protein the extra yeah. proteins and stuff and maybe that caterpillar was eating other stuff right so it might vary a diet and balance it out a bit if you're in a if the animal's in a situation where nutrition's not ideal yeah very, for the normal foods very similar to cases we've talked about where classically herbivorous animals will start eating meat to supplement their diet exactly this goes along with situations where you know prey or normal food sources are lower or rare, or even if they are abundant but low quality. Mm-hmm. Often it has been noted that cannibalism will rise. Yeah, this is all making me think of the dermestid beetle colonies mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that we use at the university when we are converting a carcass into a skeleton so that we can use the bones for research purposes. We'll often use dermestid beetles to fill a little box, put the carcass in there, and the beetles very happily will eat all of the soft tissue, the flesh and stuff off the bones. And so we make a whole bunch of them, but you have to monitor the colony because once all the flesh goes away, they will either start eating the bones because they're out of food or start eating each other. Yes. And so you have to keep it maintained and you have to keep giving them new stuff because, yeah, if they start running out of good nutritional food, they're going to eat whatever they can get. And in situations where there's a lack of food, eating another you know, beetle in that case also is more efficient than going to look for the last scraps of food because that beetle right. has already eaten it's a right bunch there. of food. Yeah, and it's right next to me. It has <laughs> accumulated. It's become a packet of nutrition because mm-hmm. it also has been looking for food. So they become your the prey of the cannibals are bioaccumulators for the rare food that everyone is looking for. You also can get situations, uh, this was noted with uh, ladybugs or lady beetles, that some of the prey they eat are toxic and have to be detoxified in their digestive process. And if a cannibal eats another beetle, well, they've already done all the that, detoxification. That process has already yeah. happened. So it saves that biological energy mm-hmm. and that, that uh, uh, process and is a more efficient meal. And there's been studies into like uh, moth caterpillars that find that m- the caterpillars that engaged in both herbivory and cannibalism developed into larger, more massive mm-hmm. caterpillars by the end and were more efficient moths overall. Yeah. That their diet seemed to push, bring, take them farther with a mixed cannibal and normal diet. But then on the flip side, straight cannibalistic diet and straight herbivorous diet were both less effective. Gotcha. So it's that mixture of different sources of nutrition that seems well. And this is a you know th- th- these are the, a lot of the same logic as to why a species might evolve towards omnivory. Yes. You know, eating plants and meat. In this case, it is just that, but the meat, quote unquote, that is available is the other caterpillars nearby. Exactly. There are things that might be complications to cannibalism. Right. Like that, that, that classic idea of, isn't this bad? Yes. Shouldn't this be a problem? Uh, there are ways that it can impact those communities. Not all organisms see that boost when cannibalism is engaged. Mm-hmm. There are some that can survive on cannibalism, but notably are not as fit as a non-cannibalistic member. That That is not as ideal a meal for the, that species, and they don't do as well. So some species seem to flourish to thrive on cannibalistic exactly. behavior others don't and it can be species to species like mm-hmm. looking across insects not all of them behave the same you also run into the problem of whether or not how selective the cannibalism is uh, many species have cannibalism that ignores or avoids related members right but like if siblings siblings or, or cousins if they don't do that then now that individual is hurting their own gene pool and their shared genetics with their relatives. So that definitely can be a danger of cannibalism that in certain situations, if the only one other members there to eat are related to the cannibal, that cannibal is now actually hurting its own genetic chances Mm long-term. 
It also can be just less efficient to do. For instance, predators that are commonly practitioners of cannibalism mm -hmm. are often specialized to hunt other species as prey. Right. A tiger is not very well adapted to hunt tigers. Exactly. So you might have to use extra energy. Like you might, it might be more tiring for a cannibal to cannibalize another member. Yeah. This makes me think there are a number of snake species that are special especially adapted for hunting other snakes. Exactly. Now, in that case, these are typically not cannibals because they're not eating other members of their own species. They're eating different species of snakes. Sometimes the word cannibalism will be used in that way. Yeah, where you're eating the same like, kind of animal, but... Yeah, the same sort of category, but like an eagle eating a songbird mm -hmm. is not technically cannibal. Those are two different species. Precisely. But... Those snakes are, like king snakes, are specially adapted for taking down other snakes. That requires a certain method of hunting. Yes. So if you don't have that specialization, it's going to be hard for you to eat that type of food. And not only may it be more difficult, it might be dangerous. Yes. A tiger trying to cannibalize another tiger. That tiger has to now take down we, a tiger. Now you have to fight a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> that's not something... No one that's wants That's never to that. a good idea. <laughs> so, like, cannibalism can be less efficient or detrimental to the individual. And it depends, you know, different species. Some of these obstacles show up and are prominent. Others, they are not at all to be seen. And that is actually a normal part of that species life cycle. One of the big ones that gets flagged and has been a focus of studies is disease. Yes. And this has been a big topic for cannibalism because... Many diseases are species specific. So if a tiger eats a deer, whatever diseases that deer has are not necessarily likely to be able to be transmitted to the tiger, mm -hmm. or at least they are less likely. But a diseased tiger, that cannibal tiger is completely susceptible. Basically all any disease that tiger has, this tiger can also get. You're the same species. This comes up a lot with parasites in focus because it's consuming. You're consuming a prey item. Mm -hmm. Anything that's in that prey. Yeah, if that tiger had a tapeworm. Yes. Now this tiger has a tapeworm. So that has been pointed out as a very likely high risk for a long time. And in the past was thought to be probably one of the reasons it would be rare in nature. This was made famous by prion diseases like mm -hmm. mad cow disease which is a disease transmitted from one cow to another when that cow eats typically spinal or brain material of another cow. And they become infected with this neurodegenerative disease that we can also be infected by if we eat infected cow it's meat. Us humans. Yes. So diseases like that, there's one famous one that is Kuru, which is a human version of this. It was made famous by the Foray people of New Guinea who practiced funerary cannibalism and was studied heavily in the 1950s and became very well known, these were probably a big part of prompting that idea that, well, cannibal obviously, we have two extremely well-documented cases of cannibalism causing detrimental diseases. Mm -hmm. More recent studies have actually found that that might not be as widespread as it was assumed. Yeah, that those might be extreme cases. And that cannibalism could also reduce parasite problems in a population, because if one member eats a, paras a, a parasitized member, they might actually eliminate yeah. that parasite from if the, the cycle. the sick one got eaten, yes. well, now it, it, it can't spread that disease to anybody. And we actually see that in certain groups. Termites are noted in dense populations to eat infected members of the colony to get rid of them so they can't spread it and the whatever infection or parasite they have can't finish its cycle. Yeah, this sort of the equivalent to what ants will I know will do of just moving a diseased ant out of the colony. Yes. This is th the same idea but th via cannibalism. Uh there was also noted in the same thing in leaf roller caterpillars, which I don't know much about them but now I'm curious of like hmm. are they rolling? Are you rolling up leaves? That's cool. Yeah, curl up like a sleeping Yeah. Bird. They will typically be herbivorous, but will eat meat when placed next to parasitized members. So it will trigger Cannibal cannibalistic behavior hmm. if there's a parasitized caterpillar near them. So you will see cannibalism come up sometimes and almost be triggered by 
sick members of the group. Yeah, interesting. Yes. So it could be a situation where our past assumptions were a little heavily weighted on a couple of examples. Uh, I saw one paper that said that really for disease to be transmitted easily, it would have to be group cannibalism where cannibals are feeding together Mm -hmm. and can transmit to each other more easily. But if it's just individual to individual, that's not actually a great pattern model for disease spread. Yeah, I get Well, because then in that case, even if a disease gets spread from one to the other, it's at the end of the whole transaction, there's still just one individual with that disease. Exactly. That's interesting because that is a very famous assumption about cannibalistic behavior in nature. That is, it is inherently self-destructive because you're going to get sick. Yeah, because you're now spreading diseases. And I do know that there are some behaviors where animals will avoid eating certain parts yeah. of the body mm-hmm. because certain parts of the body might be more prone to spreading disease. I think livers are a, a thing like this where predators will avoid livers because they will end up with toxic buildups of the substances contained within the liver. Yes, exactly. So now that we can see that cannibalism actually makes more sense than it might have. (laughs) (laughs) From a natural selection perspective. A a survival and evolutionary perspective, there's a lot of logic behind it for the the, the success of species. There are so many different versions and examples and strategies and approaches to being a cannibal in nature. Most animals are faculative cannibals where they are not usually cannibalistic right but if a situation arises that will benefit or uh, quote-unquote require cannibalism to be successful in that situation they will become cannibalistic there are some species where it is just expected that cannibalism will happen Mm. at some point in their life cycle or growth that you know tadpoles many amphibians are just known as like yeah they just cannibalize each other very very regularly yeah and that's kind of just a normal behavior for them it's it's unusual to see none of it sometimes you'll see cannibalism sometimes between the same generation within a species so you know all young or all adults or different generations adult to young sure i found one term that was hetero cannibalism for eating non-kin members non-related members i didn't see homo cannibalism for eating your own right noted so i don't know if that's a term actually cannibalism but that uh, maybe indiscriminate would be a good one for that many of these are often size dependent sure cannibals tend to be bigger than the prey member that they feed upon so when you have cannibalism within a species it's not uncommon to see adults cannibalizing young yes because that's easy food as it were and there are definitely behaviors that bump up against cannibalism but don't always involve it or don't always involve the other side of cannibalism which is killing the member cannibalistic scavenging yes scavenging a member of a a, an animal's own species is kind of cannibalistic but you didn't that animal didn't kill that member it wasn't hunted yes so that's got kind of half the equation similar you will see situations like in infanticide where a member kills the young usually of a rival or something right this is famous in lions yep. where if a new lion takes over a pride replaces the previous you know male lion that was there there are cases where they will then kill the young that were sired by that previous male exactly and that could result in cannibalism yes but it doesn't necessarily have to because that's not the reason they right. killed those that's cubs that's the goal yeah so you get situations like that where it's maybe This is kind of counts or maybe it'll occur. The cannibalism adjacent. Yes. One of the weirdest and to me coolest things that happens with cannibalistic species is something called polyphenism. There are some groups that have cannibalistic morphs. Huh. Cannibal forms that they can develop into in certain situations. Polyphenism is a term that means you have multiple forms for different situations. Right. Many animals show this uh, ants are a famous form of this where you have the worker the soldier the uh drones that are different shaped of all the same species some animals it's the individual is born and develops into that form and then they are that form forever but others can switch hmm. can de- shift into different forms and there are a m- number of them that have cannibalistic morphs 
Uh, there are nematodes and the genus Pristianchus that has two morphs with different mouths. One has a single tooth with a narrow mouth and eats bacteria. The other one has a wide mouth with two teeth and is omnivorous, capable of eating other things than bacteria, including other nematodes of its own species. Interesting. There's a cannibalistic version yeah, of these nematodes. That is just a naturally occurring morph of this species. And so that is just a natural part of the population. Mm -hmm. Probably the most famous examples that you'll see are amphibians. Amphibians metamorphose. They start out as tadpoles or you know larvae and then metamorphose into adults. Tons of them, the larva, can switch into cannibal mode if the situation requires it. There are tadpoles that are vegetarian, are herbivorous normally, but if populations get too dense, some of them will switch over into a carnivorous morph and start eating the other tadpoles to make up for the competition for food. Exchanging their filter feeding mouth parts for a keratinized beak to... For taking down tadpoles. For taking down tadpoles. Oh, wow. Uh, my favorite example of this are tiger salamanders. They have their larvae, which are the little salamanders that have the gills. Mm -hmm. Not fully tadpole, but aquatic, fully aquatic larvae. They have the normal ones that just look like little baby uh, salamanders. And then the cannibal morph, which is notably bigger. And as one researcher quoted, super wide mouths with crazy sets of teeth <laughs> for taking down other baby salamanders. Salamander eating mouths. But once they metamorphose into adults, they metamorphose into the same kind of adult. Right. That's there's, only there's a larval only thing. One adult morph. Yes. Yeah. So they don't become a different kind of adult. It's just during that development. Yeah, well, and this goes back to that selective pressure for there being a selective benefit for developing animals yes. to get as much nutrition as they can. Like we saw with the caterpillars, like we're seeing with uh, the tadpoles and salamanders. And there's the popular situation of if the populations get dense, we see more cannibal salamanders, you know, like in a shrinking pond. Mm -hmm. But also if there's a huge density of the, the prey that they typically, because the typical morphs are also eating prey, but they're eating like invertebrates, bugs and sure. little arthropods. If there's an abundance of prey, we will also see more cannibals show up because an abundance of prey promotes size differences in the young. And if the salamander is big enough to be a cannibal, they will often become cannibals. Oh, okay. So if there's a chance to be a cannibal, the salamander takes it. That's interesting because I would have assumed it would be the opposite. Yeah. If there's abundant prey, there's no need to be eating the other salamanders. And with other species, that's often the case. Yeah, but here it sounds like if there is a benefit to being able to eat prey and there's a benefit to being good at that, well, that includes those cannibalistic tendencies. Yeah, well, in that it seems that cannibalism is advantageous, period, for larvae of the tiger salamander. Yeah. So if they are able to do it, they will yeah. because they will develop well under those situations. That's interesting. Another very interesting form of cannibalism that we've mentioned before is interuterine cannibalism, yep. where embryos or, or developing uh, fetuses eat the other members inside the parent's womb. Right. In, in live birth, we talked about how there are many different forms of embryo nutrition. In mammals like us, there's a placenta, uh, animals that lay eggs, there's a yolk that provides nutrition. There are some animals where some of that nutrition comes from the other embryos Yes, that they will intake. Uh, there are some sharks that very famously do this. Absolutely. The tiger shark, the sand tiger shark is the, the go-to example because it actually has, they actually have a two-chambered womb so that there will be two young left and they can't get to each other. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that you they will end up with two well-developed young. Right. One way or the other, yes. there's going to be two. But they can't get to each other so that you, there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> there's also parental cannibalism, which I f we've talked about uh, some examples, like the, the one nematode that digests its digestive system to turn it into a milk that then the, the young feed off of. Yeah. We talked about that in the milk episode. There's another nematode where... In low resource situations where there's not a ton of food, it will switch from being an egg laying to a somewhat live birthing 
and the young will eat their way out mm-hmm. to get the nutrition that is lacking in the environment from the parent's body. Yeah. We also talked in Sicilians, yep. episode 162, about some Sicilians the young, will grow a special nutritious layer of skin Mm -hmm. that the young then eat to get their nutrition. Absolutely. Which does raise the really interesting question of where on the (laughs) spectrum from eating a special nutritious layer of skin and eating their way out of the parent's body and drinking milk produced by a parent. Where do we put the line at now this is cannibalism? That's most definitions I found for cannibalism specified killing And consuming Mm -hmm. part of or all another individual of the same species. Right. Killing was typically part of the definition. Yeah. That it has to result in the death of another member of the species. And in the other nematode where they eat their way out, it is fatal Mm -hmm. to the parent. So, like, there, it is, (laughs) an animal could eat a finger of another member, and that's not technically cannibalism by that definition. Interesting. Because well, like, they have not killed that other member. Right, like Crocs yes. will find, just like <laughs> tear, take the arm tear off. a leg off. It's not actually cannibalism <laughs> that it, by this definition, but it sure is close. Sure. Which is what the Croc will yell at that Croc. That's not even really cannibalism. <laughs> and then Stop swim whining. <laughs> the coolest form of parental cannibalism I found is the desert spider. While a female is gestating eggs... In the the incubation sac, the midgut of the female starts to degrade, starts to break down. When the young emerge, the female will feed them by regurgitating fluid for them to eat. And in that fluid, digested, you know, broken down parts of the midgut are found in that fluid. Mm, so and they're dissolving parts of their own body to yeah. then provide as nutrition. And then the female will finally die and the young will feed on the female's body whose abdomen has now full of liquidized digestive tract. And so this is a facilitated form of parental cannibalism that results in maximum nutritional delivery to the young. Yeah, the the parent has turned their body into a slushy. Yes. For a smoothie, a spider smoothie for the young to enjoy and then grow upon. Exactly. That's so gross and cool. Right? So this is a very, this is like a fatal reproductive cycle like we see in octopus where Mm -hmm. they die when they reproduce. But this one is specifically including cannibalism as part of the parental care of the young. Yeah, as part of that nutritional... It's really... It's it's using every part of the spider. Absolutely. We are going to evolve in this direction where the reproductive cycle is going to be the end of this spider's life might as well use this opportunity to also provide nutrition to those young absolutely very cool now those examples that we've talked about so far at least to me make pretty obvious sense of its competition Mm -hmm. you know competing usually with other young and whatnot and parental care is a parent sacrificing themselves for the care of the young let's talk about some cannibalisms that don't seem to make sense right off the bat filial cannibalism where parents eat their young yeah how could that be beneficial for a parent to kill their progeny this is what the best description i could think of is the group we talked about last time was sacrificial parents these are very pragmatic parents (laughs) there are situations where it could be beneficial or crucial for a parent to kill and eat their young It occurs in tons of animals. It seems like it would be a very rare thing, but it's actually very common from mammals to reptiles to insects and other inverts. It's often associated with animals that show parental care. Because the adults and the young are staying together. Exactly. They're already closely tied in their behavior and their interactions. And the babies are also reliant on the parent, which Mm. makes them very easy prey, so to speak. There are some obvious situations that this makes sense if the young is stillborn Mm -hmm. if the young aren't alive upon birth or die shortly after at that point that both is just retaking that nutrition but also cleaning up the area potentially Mm -hmm. very similar to a lot of animals will eat placenta or those tissues that are involved in giving birth if there are limited resources in the area some animals are known to eat typically only some of the young because they wouldn't be able to provide for all of them. Yeah. Uh, this is seen in cats. If they have a litter that is too large for the amount of nutrition, either fat storage they have or 
nutrition they're getting to produce milk for, they will eat some of the kittens and now be able to provide milk for the remaining kittens. Mm -hmm. Squirrels are also known to do this with sick or injured young, and that's both getting that nutrition back, but also now they can focus on the healthy remaining young and have a higher chance of their survival. This also comes up if there's just too little resources for the parent to survive. If caring right. for the young might cause the parent to starve, many animals will, instead of starving, trying to care for the young, eat the young. Because if the parent dies, the young are going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. If they're relying on the parent. But if the parent survives, they can breed again in following seasons. This is also noted with some like male fish that protect eggs. If they are not in peak condition due to... The, the mating period or, or competition, mm -hmm. they might eat some Let's of the eggs, start eating eggs and be a better shape to protect the rest of the eggs yeah. and bolster themselves. This is also seen in a kind of a similar way of if it's a very threatened or unstable situation. This is very common in cats. You, uh, I've, I've known many people who've had a cat that has kittens. And if the cat starts hiding the kittens and doesn't feel safe, they may eat the kittens because from a logical standpoint, if it's very, if they feel very likely that a predator might get the kid, the young, why let a predator eat them? If, if the young are going to die, better for the parent to get nutrition and energy back and have a better chance to try again in a more stable situation. So we can see the selective benefit for this kind of behavior that ends up improving the chances of this individual or this lineage surviving in the long run. Yes, it either is better for the rest of the young that remain or better for the parent to have another chance mm -hmm. to have offspring again. It's also been noted in situations where paternity is uncertain. Male fish in situations where sneaking, where males will sneak in some of their eggs or fertilize some of the eggs, mm -hmm. if it's unsure... Who fertilized this clutch of eggs? Right. Cannibalism. Which, which male? Yeah. Cannibalism becomes more likely because the male, it is not ideal for the male to use their energy on protecting eggs that they did not fertilize. Right. This is the same sort of thing where we talked about with the lions. Yes. If a new male comes in, we'll get rid of that young and potentially replace them with this male's own young, yes. which is part of that same genetic lineage, and there's your selective benefit again. There is no benefit to the male to raise another male's young when it's not going to further their genetics. Mm -hmm. How these fish are able to tell is unsure. Yeah. <laughs> How they're able to recognize. And they did a study where, with three spine sticklebacks that do this, they made mixed fertilized nests in the lab and then let males guard them. And in the more mixed nests of different males, the eggs would be eaten. Interesting. So somehow the male can tell these eggs are not mine. Yeah. There's uh, a smell to it or something. Yeah. Or there's eggs that aren't mine that are at least here. And often the whole nest would be eaten. It's we will, we will eliminate this run gotcha. and, and try again. Interesting. Another one that's a very extreme and kind of, counterintuitive it seems is sexual cannibalism mm -hmm. uh, very famous very famous not super common across groups of life yeah which is interesting and i, I just to, to make the point that's the first time we've said that yes. about one of these categories of cannibalism absolutely this one is fairly rare but the groups it does occur in it is very common yeah Spiders, this is extremely common, typically with females, because females are larger than males on yes. average in spiders. And mantises, famously, the praying mantis with the female eating the male during mating. Mm -hmm. uh, scorpions as well. There are also some other uh, crustaceans and uh, inverts that show this. I saw some fish mentioned, but not commonly. Okay. So I don't know how sure it is that that's a regular thing to happen. This can occur... During mating, right after mating, and in some, before mating even has a chance to happen. Yeah. But that typically in all of these females eating the male during courtship copulation or right after mm -hmm. is very common in these groups. Now, the benefits of this are obvious for the female in the regards that if the female's hungry, that's a meal. Right. Well, and now, that, now there's eggs to produce exactly. or yeah. whatever. There's a... There's a Strong benefit to getting a bunch of nutrition. There are a lot of species of invertebrates 
that will actually, the males will put together some nutritional stuff yes. as a gift. Yes. Be, for a very similar reason. Mm-hmm. To, yeah, if there's nutrition, that's going to give that female a head start in developing that young. And we see some males that take steps like that to actively avoid being cannibalized. Yes. There are some that seem to participate in the cannibalism. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's another question. Why would it be beneficial to a male if cannibalism is almost guaranteed? Which in none of them is it guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, it's famous with mantises that that is what always happens. But it's not a 100% thing. I think it's like usually a 70 to 60% okay. of the time. There are plenty of times many of these males make it to get away and survive. But there are a bunch where it is more often than not the male doesn't survive and... How could that help? And one thing is it could prolong copulation. That allows mm. the male to mate for longer because many of them, like the praying mantis is famous for, when the female turns around and eats the male's head, the body can continue mating. The nerves continue firing. Right. And it can f- continue to mate, which can raise their chances of further fertilizing the eggs the female has. Right. This potentially strengthens that litter or clutch of offspring. And if the male can keep their body in the way, that might deter other males from being able to mate again yes. and replace <laughs> the fertilization they just attempted. We see this a lot in sexual behavior in animals, especially in vertebrates, this competition to crowd out other individuals exactly. that might be trying to mate as well. There are so many different versions of this. Uh, we can't go through nearly the list. Yep. Sending your request now for an episode on sexual cannibalism. Because it's fascinating. <laughs> uh, you have things like there are scorpions that will sting the female to put off being eaten. Okay, like f- <laughs> fight off yep. the inevitability of being eaten. There are uh, orb weaver spiders that will wait until the female is molting and can't eat them because huh. their fangs have not hardened up. Uh, one species is, uh, will surround the female with silk that doesn't actually restrain them, but it is enough to deter feeding behavior. Okay. And so just wraps them around a few times with silk and then can mate. There's a few that provide the gifts that you mentioned, and some can even, will wrap them up and can wrap up bad gifts, already eaten crickets. Yes. I think, uh, (laughs) spiders do this. Yeah. There are spiders that will bring gifts. And part of that is to here, eat this. Instead of eating the male who will now try to mate. Yep, they call them nuptial gifts. Yes. <laughs> uh, many will just wait until the female has already caught prey and is feeding. Mm. And so they will just follow the female, wait. Once the female catches prey, then they'll mate. All right. Now that the female's busy. Yes. By far, one of the most extreme and crazy examples of this is the Australian redback spider. Which, when the male goes to mate... So the way spiders typically mate is the males have pedipalps, two little front appendages that are specially designed to hold their sperm. So they Mm -hmm. load those up, then they will go and the female spider has two spermatheca, which are two openings on their abdomen that they will put that pedipalp in or the tip of it in and load and inseminate the female and mate, blah, blah, blah. When the males come to do that, they will then do a somersault as it was called every single time it was mentioned, (laughs) which will then flip their body over and bring their abdomen right to the mouth of the female allowing the female to feed huh. while they finish the insertion of the pedipalp. Yeah, that spider has brought a gift, and the gift is itself. Yes, and this is thought to be that the longer they can continue that process, and so letting the female feed on them lets them slowly die, but not be interrupted during yeah. the mating. Well, and then also providing that nutrition. So it's a whole adaptation sequence to strengthen the possibility of the survival of these offspring. And they did note that in situations where this happens, females are less likely to mate with other males. Mm -hmm. And the male is able to fertilize around double the eggs versus if it's versus those that didn't somersault and die. So it does have direct effects on their success in parentage and the risk is fairly low because when they rip the pedipalp off to leave it in the female's spermatheca it's going that's causes a mortal wound that will cause the spider to die anyway yeah this is very similar in terms of that selective pressure to some of those parental examples where if this individual is 
only liable to produce one group of offspring anyway, then behavior like this can help further along that group. of You're giving yeah. it the best chance of survival. Yeah. If it ends up benefiting the female, which then benefits that brood of eggs. Yeah. Well, then might as well, because that male's probably not going to make it to another mating cycle anyway. There's one related species that can pull their organs to the front of the abdomen away from where it will be bitten. So on the first somersault, they get bitten. It hurts. Some damage is done, but they don't die. So they can prevent perform a second somersault to use the other pedipalp and the other spermatheca opening and get a second mating in with the same female. As one put it, none survive the second somersault. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, that's a cool trick. You can only do it twice. Right? That's it's like, don't worry. I moved my vital organs out of the way so that we could do this twice. Exactly. Wow. It is extremely fascinating. Sexual cannibalism is by far one of the most studied forms of cannibalism mm -hmm. because not only is it so seemingly contradictory to what would be successful for like, why right. would a mating male voluntarily allow themselves to be eaten? Yep. But also there's so many different versions of it that trying to figure out how it evolved is quite the conundrum yeah well and reproductive behavior in general gets studied a lot especially in evolutionary biology because reproduction is sort of the front line of natural selection like, yep that's where your selective pressure tends to be extremely strong that behavior there is extremely relevant to the survival of that lineage and so that is the realm where behavior often gets quite extreme or unexpected or dramatic. And this is a really fascinating example of that. It really is. So we will talk more about the evolution of these kinds of cannibalism after the break. But before we talk about that, once we come back from our musical interlude, we will talk about cannibalism in the fossil record. Oh, fossils eating fossils. And how you can detect whether a fossil ate a fossil. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. As is often the case when we talk about behavior, I feel like a lot of second parts of our episodes start this way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> when we're talking about trying to find a behavior in the fossil record, it can be tough or at least murky to get definitive evidence. Every paper I found discussing cannibalism in the fossil record used some version of the phrase that it is strongly lacking or rare. Yeah. It is not something we see a lot of. There are examples and there are discussed potential examples. Like there are situations that could be, but it's hard to confirm that it was. Yes. I'm very glad that we had the discussion in the first half about how common and diverse cannibalism is as a behavior. Yes. Because if we started with the discussion of fossil, yeah, we have kind of very little, almost no direct evidence of cannibalism in the fossil record. Now, at this point in the episode, us and our audience can have the sense of that shouldn't be the case. Yes. Like, that's not a feature of the life of the past. That is a feature of the fossil record. Exactly. That can't, the, the evidences that we could potentially get for cannibalism are just not things that come up very often. Yeah. And we've talked about just getting diet information in general from fossils, especially if you want to get more specific than meat or leaves or grass. Yep. If we want to figure out exactly, like we, we almost never can say what type of tree yes. was this animal feeding on? Which specific prey was this predator eating? That's almost impossible to tell most of the time. So very often we are relying on and looking for extremely well-preserved things like gut contents. Yep. It can be a great way, but that is not a commonly preserved thing in species and You'd have to hope that the meal that preserves was a cannibalistic one for that species. Yes. So we have that limitation. You can get like bite marks and marks on bones, but that's only if it's a animal that is going to be biting onto the bone. There are many animals that don't leave bite marks on bones because they don't bite that far in. Yes. So 
the type of feeding traces can often be limiting as to confirm. And then you also have to be able to determine these feeding traces were left by the same species this bone is from. Yes. And that is particularly both in the case of gut contents and feeding traces being able to say this is the same species, the eater is the same species as the ET, is very difficult, and that's even leaving out the point that what counts as a species is different in the fossil record yeah. than what it is <laughs> when we look at living species. So cannibalism, you you could make an argument that cannibalism is impossible to determine in the fossil record. Yes. <laughs> depending on how you define species. Absolutely. Right. So it, it, it gets into a lot of tricky identification questions. But there are some examples that are particularly robust or at least very often discussed mm -hmm. in this topic. So let's go through some of the more notable and famous ones. Yeah. Uh, the first ones I wanted to mention, just because there's not, I don't actually have a ton to say about them, and they are the ones that will often come up first when you look up fossil cannibalism. There is evidence of human bones that seem to have butchery marks on them. Oh, yeah, like cut marks from knives, tools exactly. that were used to carve off meat, like we see in a lot of animal species. Which is one of those cases where we have tons of evidence of cut marks on bones from humans carving meat off of other animal bones. Right, mammoths and whatever else. So we're able to determine pretty surely, yep, this was made with a stone tool and it was probably this kind of stone tool. Mm -hmm. And so we do have evidence of ancient human, at least butchery, which has led to typically the assumption of that probably means some form of cannibalism. Right. Uh, we can't know what they did with those bones after they butchered the meat off of them, but it's the same marks that we show on animals that we know were part of their diet. Right. So we do have examples of that. We have those that show up in the Pleistocene in Kenya. There was one that I found that uh, has a bit more information to it with uh, humans from Europe from a, I, I wasn't sure if this is referring to the age period or the also the grouping of these people, but it was the Mengdelian from 23,000 to 13,000 years ago in the Upper Paleolithic with similar evidence of, of butch, cut marks on human bones. These have been interpreted as funerary cannibalism practices mm -hmm. of honoring or ritualizing the dead through some consumption. But they were able to note that if this is that type of funerary practice, uh, it seems to be more abundant in the middle Magdalene and less in the upper and end of it. Hmm. So it seems like this went out of practice if yeah. it is a, relig a, a religious or ritualistic practice. Yeah, that something has changed over time in this activity. Yeah, and they also were able to note it, connect it with genetic groups of, of humans during this time to see that this group seemed to be practicing it, those groups didn't. Interesting. Uh, so there are some very interesting things about potentially cultural shifts that these sort of finds might tell us. But mu much like our first section, we are not anthropologists, yes. so that's about <laughs> all we're going to say about that. Put in your requests now <laughs> for an episode on cultural cannibalism. Yes, which we will find a guest for. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest, from what it seems, it... Fairly undisputed evidence of cannibalism in the animal fossil record is a semi-aquatic reptile, Monjurosuchus splendens, which is from the early Cretaceous of China. It's a specimen of an adult individual with seven smaller skulls in its abdominal cavity that are indistinguishable from the adult skull. Okay. So we have the same species inside the body of the same species. Yeah. There is no postcranial remains so behind the head, behind bones. the head of those young skulls, which mm. has what is what led them to not interpret it as a female with young, right, with uh, embryos, pre pregnant with young. Yeah, the the heads are each about twenty millimeters long, and has led to the interpretation that these were cannibalized by this adult. Yeah, interesting. There's some fun patterns noticed. All the skulls are facing toward the front of the body of the adult, minus one of them. Hmm. So they're all in a very similar position, suggesting they were probably eaten in a similar way. This is interpreted as the position they were swallowed in. Mm -hmm. The frontmost skulls are in better condition than the backmost skulls, which very likely is giving us an interpretation of the digestion process and rate yep. of this adult. 
And the little skulls are almost all the same size, which might mean they came from a single group of young. Yeah, a, a single clutch. Yeah, a nest or, or brood or whatever uh, we would have called the grouping of babies of this ancient reptile. Which also brings up the question of, was this someone else's young or right. this adult's did, did young? Did this adult raid a nest? Mm -hmm. Or was this one of those cases where it's eating its own offspring? The fact that only the heads rain might also give evidence as to how the adult ate them, that it might have mm -hmm. killed the young, then just eaten the head. Just taken the heads. And this might give us information about what kind of conditions the environment and ecosystem that animals found at the time, that maybe things were a little more stressful or populations were a little more dense. Mm -hmm. The kind of situations mm -hmm. we see this behavior in modern animals. And one, uh, the paper I found that was describing it did note that frequent uh, volcanic eruptions during this period of the Cretaceous in that area could have been shifting things in the environment that caused some situation. Mm. This is one situation. So for all we know, this species was just commonly doing this. Right. Or uh, this was the only time it ever happened. Yes. Like, it, <laughs> yeah, we, we have very little information to go. So on. this may have give us insights into how dire things were for the species, or it might be a, just another day in the life of this species. Mm -hmm. There are also famously fish that are found with members of their own species inside their stomach. Uh, there was a oligocene cutlass fish noted with this. These are fish, uh, a group of fish that are still around today, or at least members of this group are still around today, and they also show cannibalistic tendencies. Mm -hmm. uh, this species in the genus Enenchelum, one had prey in its stomach, two different species, one of which was its own. I also found one that was a early Jurassic fish, Pachycormus, which has three different specimens that all show young of their own species in their stomach, which is the only example I, I think I found in any of my lookings that was multiple specimens within a species all showing. Yeah, uh, so that potential cannibalism. This seems to say, considering how rare this is in the fossil record, the fact that we found three probably means it was a regular behavior, at least during that time for that species where they were found. Mm -hmm. It also evidently lines up with previous findings that suggested a dietary shift for this fish from fish eating when they're younger to cephalopod eating when they're older because the cannibals were also juveniles. Okay, interesting. So it seems to line up that, yeah, they were more fish eating, including their own peers. Yeah, yeah their own species. <laughs> yep. And then shift would have shifted out of that as they got older, so they might have become less cannibalistic as they shifted to a different prey. Interesting. And then I found one example of potentially uh, fossil evidence of interuterine cannibalism. There is a Paleozoic chondrichthys, so the cousins of the group that includes uh, sharks, and this one's more closely related to the group that includes like ratfish and chimera. Mm -hmm. This is the genus Delphiodontus. There's uh, two specimens that are, paper described them as fetal, very, very young. Mm -hmm. uh, so either very recently born or not yet born. They So they kind of resemble tadpoles, the bulby body with a tail coming off. There's one uh, bit of art of it that I found on Wikipedia. And that, yeah, they look like spiny tadpoles, but had well-developed sharp beaks and slashing and piercing teeth inside it. So they have very well-developed biting mouth parts already. And inside the intestines of at least one of them, I don't know if it, both of them had it, there seems to be other fetal material. So this suggests that they were eating each other at an extremely young age, potentially before even being born yet. Yeah, we do also see nest cannibalism. Yes, exactly. In some species. So this can happen intrauterine, it can happen in the nest, it can happen like those tadpoles and salamanders a little later on in larval development. So this could just be sibling cannibalism, mm -hmm. uh, but it could potentially be interuterine. Yeah, that's really interesting. Right? Wow. All this is making me remember that at the Gray Fossil Site, there is a partial alligator skeleton. Oh, right. And Sean has told me that in prepping it, he found smaller alligator bones in the gut region of this partial alligator skeleton, which I forgot. appears to be uh, potentially this alligator ate an alligator. And this is an interesting case where we are pretty confident based on what we know about this environment and ecosystems over time that there was only one species of gator here. Yes. It's very likely there was only one species of gator, so this is potentially a cannibalistic gator. Which makes all the sense, because crocs are 
quite cannibalistic. Yes. Crocs are not picky eaters no. across the board. And they, it is well known that female crocodilians have to guard the young that because they are quite good parents and will guard the young, but they will guard them against males that approach because yes. the males often do not discern the young as anything other than bite-sized food sources. Yeah. And there's tons of images you'll find of like a gator eating a smaller gator that's all that's still like half its size. Yeah. That they will continue yeah. cannibalism outside of babies. And this one if I remember what Sean told me correctly, this was not a tiny gator. Yep inside the other gets so this this was not just an eating young thing i've seen so many pictures of like a 10 foot gator with a four or five foot gator's tail sticking out of its mouth yep <laughs> they yep. they are on each other's menu well into adulthood you were start you started saying the oldest sort of definitive agreed upon case and i noticed myself expecting it to be way way back mm -hmm. because i have Memories of seeing papers and articles talking about cannibalism in things like trilobites. Yes. And I wanted to mention that because there has been some studies that indicate some trilobites were specialized for eating other trilobites. Yes. That they have the mouth parts that were good for crushing. I think there have been some trilobites found with fragments in their guts from other trilobites. And that's one of those cases where, like we were saying before... There were lots of species of trilobites. Yes. So the headlines will call it cannibalism, trilobites eating other trilobites. But again, depending on our definition, if we're only saying the same species, these are species that could be cannibals. Yes. That, that they could be specialized for eating other trilobites, including their own species. But there's that blurriness where it can be very difficult to say, all right, but, but there were a dozen species of trilobites mm -hmm. here. We don't know if this was eating the same species. And very pointedly, I did not see that get mentioned in any of the papers. Interesting. I was looking up listing examples of cannibalism. Yeah. Uh, and the one with that uh, uh, aquatic reptile described it as the oldest confirmed case. Yeah. So, like, those are trilobite eating trilobites, but doesn't seem to be considered a lot of them were any solid evidence that they were eating their own species. Right, like definitive mm -hmm. cannibal evidence. So yeah, you have a lot of... And as you mentioned at the beginning, it's very likely a bunch of fossil animals that we know of... Oh, sure. ...were practicing cannibalism because tons of animals today, it's not something that showed up in the last 2,000 years. Like, right. it's this something that... This is a that common behavior in nature. Surely would have been going on. How common it was and which species would have been... Showing it more is where a lot of the discussion comes up. One of the most famous in that regard is whether or not theropod, the two-legged, typically predatory dinosaurs, were major cannibals or not. Yeah, yeah, this comes up a lot with did meat-eating dinosaurs eat other members of their species. This is made famous by one particular case, the Coelophysis case. Yes, one of the maybe top two most famous stories of falsely accused dinosaurs. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> of a dinosaur that became famous for eating something that it turns out that's not what it was doing. In 1947, a bone bed of hundreds of Coelophysis fossils were found. These are small predatory dinosaurs from early Mesozoic in the Triassic. Yeah, this is a ghost ranch. Yes. I believe the famous Coelophysis bone beds. Absolutely, in New Mexico. These were a very successful dinosaur during the Triassic, uh, one of the early extremely successful dinosaur groups. Two of the specimens at this site that were very well preserved had a ton of small, what seemed to be archosaur bones, so at least in the same group as dinosaurs, inside their body cavities. These were deduced at the time and labeled as young Coelophysis. And therefore cannibalistic and therefore adults filial cannibalism in the fossil record. Yes. And I, I remember reading books, like having kids books that would have art of like a coelophysis with like the leg of a small coelophysis hanging out of its mouth or yep. something. And it definitely leaned into a lot of those ideas of them being cold and uncaring reptiles. Yeah. It, it very much fits that narrative of not only dinosaurs as being cold reptiles, but also the distant past yes. is often presented as primal or savage or blah, blah, blah. Un uncivilized. Yeah, which is interesting in both the respect that 
it's not fair to assume that dinosaurs were cannibals on the basis that they must have been cold and primal and whatever, because that's not what cannibalism is about. Is about. <laughs> that's also not how reptiles are. Mm-hmm. And that's also not what the past was like. That's that's all misconceptions. But on the other hand, it's also very reasonable to infer that dinosaurs were cannibalistic sometimes. Because they were animals. Tons of animals are cannibalistic <laughs> sometimes. So it is a perfectly reasonable <laughs> hypothesis, but not for those reasons. Exactly. <laughs> In this case, a later on, more detailed examination of the bones found out that these are not coelophysis, small baby coelophysis, but small crocodilomorphs. Yes. And therefore, not cannibalism, just coelophysis eating small animals. Yes. (laughs) I believe the story goes, and I don't actually know where this story comes from. This might be apocryphal, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that the researcher who ended up doing that paper walked by an advertisement oh, yes, for yes. an exhibit about these dinosaurs and looked at the image of the fossils and went, those are crocodilomorph bones. Yep, yep. And then went and ended up getting involved in that research. I, do I don't re- know how true that is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember I've... hearing that like in the, the interview, like uh, I think it was in like National Geographic or something that mm-hmm. I remember reading that. Uh, and yeah, I, that's whether or not that's for sure what happened, it's a good story. It is a fun story, <laughs> which is why I remember it. Yep. This has led to kind of a rethinking because that initial evidence of coelophysis was used very much to say it's probably the case that theropod dinosaurs were eating each other left and right, that they were cannibalistic all over the place. And this was prominent. It was there early on in the the success of dinosaurs. And therefore it was, quote unquote, rampant right. through theropods. <laughs> This new understanding of it has caused the scientific community to take a step back and go, would it have been? Right. What what are what is that assumption based yeah. off of? Do we actually have all, any other evidence that supports their predators, which predators very often are more likely to be cannibals? But looking at today's theropods, birds, cannibalism isn't as common as some other groups. Yeah, uh, that's true. Among birds of prey, predatory birds, it shows up more, but it is not super common among birds. Yeah. And, but then on the other hand, of course, the closest living relatives to dinosaurs, yep. crocodilians, it is quite common in them. So there's been multiple findings that have been looked at to see where it weighs on this question. First and foremost, theropod bite marks are particularly rare. That's not a thing we find commonly, which probably suggests that a lot of theropods were not chewing on bone. Right. They were not biting down to the bone. They were biting the meat off while they fed and then leaving the bone. So we don't have a ton of chances to find that a theropod bit another member of their own species. There are some exceptions. Uh, One large finding of theropod bite marks was from the Jurassic uh, Jurassic deposit in Colorado, which these numbers are fun. They surveyed 2,368 fossils, 684 of them had bite marks on it, 28%, Mm -hmm. which is a ridiculous percentage compared to how many they typically find of theropod bite marks at other fossil sites. Yeah. These showed the zigzag striated impressions of ziphodont teeth, those serrated knife-like teeth that we've discussed theropods having in previous episodes. This does give some information of, like, the minimum size of the biter. Sure. It is consistent with two of the predators common at the site, Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus. There's one bite mark that they said suggests a much larger theropod was present. Mm -hmm. Potentially a really big Allosaurus or maybe a different species that has yet to be identified. Most of them are on sauropod bones and a a couple of other dinosaurs, but sauropods were the main bite receivers. (laughs) But there were a number of bites on theropod bones, Mm -hmm. especially on Allosaurus remains. This, though, has often been interpreted as a sign of scavenging. Yes. Because a lot of them are on uh, meteor bones like ribs, but also on toe bones and things that would have been at the ends, as they put it, far from the choicest cuts. Yes, the last parts you go to for food. Which could suggest that this was a situation where, for whatever reason here, Bodies were able to be scavenged for long periods mm-hmm. and get down to the the less ideal meaty parts. And that this included dead theropods that would then be scavenged by other theropods, potentially or maybe not of their own species. Yes. Which brings us back to that 
Yes. How do we define cannibalism? And it also has that issue of we don't know what killed that animal that is now being scavenged. Right. It could have been a cannibalistic kill that then was scavenged by either other Allosaurus or a <laughs> Ceratosaurus. Yeah. So there's strong evidence that this is definitely Allosaurus feeding on Allosaurus. Yes. Whether it's cannibalism, Hunting, scavenging, yeah. This one will come up a lot. I saw this mentioned a number of times. Yeah. Similar situation. There are four specimens of Tyrannosaurus rex that have tooth marks on them mm -hmm. from other theropods that are large, which many have inferred to suggest probably other Tyrannosaurus rex individuals. Yes. Since in many of the places these are found, that's really the only other large enough theropod to be the one leaving the bites. Yep. Though I did see one paper mention that in some of them, at least, there are Despletosaurus and Gorgosaurus in those areas. So there are other Tyrannosaurs that are different species. Right. And they could be biting each other. And could be biting spe you know, two species. Yeah. Cross species biting. Exactly. But many of these bite marks have been interpreted as potential feeding traces. Right. Which, as again, could be cannibalistic yeah and there's also been other studies that have found bite marks on like the face yeah that have been interpreted as maybe fighting yes. or competition and that's also one of those weird gray areas of crocs will kill each other when they're fighting right for territory or mating or something so if a t-rex kills another t-rex over a territory or a mate how cannibalistic is that right you know, is that now a meal <laughs> it bit it does it, if it eats it, then it's cannibalism, but it didn't hunt that other individual. Right. So yeah. if you just took down that other T-Rex and got some meat stuck in your teeth. And then swallowed. Is that cannibalism? <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think of the question I saw with gremlins of if they get a food stuck in their teeth and then swallow it after midnight. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> well, better uh, be safe. <laughs> Floss uh, before midnight. Yes. <laughs> I know there's at least also one uh, notable case of a Deinonychus bone with bite marks in it that have been attributed to other Deinonychus. Yes, I saw Deinonychus come up. I, I struggled finding which study it was, and so that was what yeah. it was referring to. If, if I remember right, it was a specimen from the Cloverleaf Formation. Mm -hmm. And this has come up specifically in the context of the discussion of whether Deinonychus were pack hunters. Yes. And this was has been used in discussions to say, well, if this one ate another one, if this was eaten by another Deinonychus, maybe they weren't cooperative mm -hmm. hunters. They were eating each other. The only one I found, and I found this also referenced in others as the only solid example of theropod cannibalism, is an abelisaurid from Madagascar, Majungatholos atopus. Oh, yeah. This is from the Cretaceous and has multiple individuals with bones that are, as one thing put it, intensely toothmarked. Mm. That they have many tooth marks who the only fitting culprit could be other Majungatholoses. We have also evidence that they clearly fed upon sauropods. Like we have bite marks as well on other sure. dinosaurs, but there are multiple specimens of this species with bite marks that only make sense to be attributed to this species. Yes, and it sounds like lots of biting. Yes, like very avid biting. I mean, they were getting way down to the bone or chewing on the bone potentially. Mm-hmm. I saw this multiple times mentioned as the only compelling evidence of theropod cannibalism Interesting. that we currently have. There are others potential that T-Rex could be, the Allosaurs could be, yeah. but there's also lots of other scenarios. This one, it's regular enough, which considering how rare both theropod bite marks are and cannibalism evidence is, suggests it was happening regularly, that it seems unlikely this is just extremely common scavenging. Yeah. Cannibalism is in that interesting category alongside things like courtship displays. It's like, did dinosaurs do that? Yes. Almost certainly, probably tons of them did that all the time. Exactly. But direct evidence for it is extremely difficult to pin down. Yes. It's often that thing of, yeah, for sure there were species doing it. Did this species do it? I don't know. Right. Did this species do it? Maybe. Right. Is this evidence of that? Could be. Yeah. And so... Trying to identify it is very difficult. Also, uh, understanding the evolution of cannibalism can be difficult just because it is so varied and yeah. it's hard to track in the fossil record. So we have to kind of infer behavioral relationships and look for patterns to suggest what pressures and what benefits could have prompted this to be evolutionarily beneficial to stick around 
right in the genetics of a species there are so many different situations and contexts and styles that cannibalism shows up in in so many different groups of animals that it's very difficult to find consistent this came up a little bit in the last episode about migration yep like, there is such diversity of this behavior and it's so variable it's hard to find consistent across the board patterns that tell us about the evolutionary history of it and it is 100 percent evolved multiple times like there is not oh, an sure. ancestral cannibal origin for all animals even though probably the earliest animals were doing it right but it's probably been lost and gained and changed and adjusted so many times yeah I, art, one, I one might argue that the very earliest animals, if they were predatory, had to have been doing it. Right? <laughs> Just, right. That, was, that, was, that was it. What else was there? That was it. That was all there was. And, like, there are situations where you can watch a group of animals be, become more cannibalistic just due to the specific situation they're in. Yeah. Like, Which, like, with migration, we yes. talked about in the last episode. And, like, so many herbivores will eat meat when they find it. If they're in a situation where the only meat they're able to find are others of their own species, that's a very quick route to cannibalism. Yes. This is, again, like the migration discussion, just like migration in some ways isn't a distinct behavior. It's just a part of locomotion. Cannibalism is just a category of thing to eat. Yeah. And it's a very arbitrary category on our part. We've classified this species... And so we are calling it cannibalism within the species. So especially when we're not talking about those specific cases like sexual cannibalism, mm -hmm. intrauterine cannibalism. If it's just a gator eating another gator, that's not even particularly notable as a behavior. Yeah. Dis there's no difference between that and a gator eating basically anything else. I saw that mentioned with predatory insects, that it's so common that with many of them, it's just noted as a normal part of their diet. Yeah, that's exactly. They, they eat other insects. Their species are other insects. That yes, they just eat any other insect that they get a chance to eat. So in many of those kale, in a lot of cases of cannibalistic species, the question of the evolution of that behavior is almost a moot point. Yes, it's like well, that is the same question as the evolution of that species being predatory. Yes. So instead of trying to dive into the evolution of can let's talk about some fun examples. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's fun just, cannibalism. Some interesting quirks and trends that have been noticed in certain kinds of cannibalism. Uh, one is inducible defenses in prey. Inducible defenses are defenses that show up after first contact with a predator. Uh, this is very famous in plants. That plants that start to be chewed on by a caterpillar will induce defenses, chemical defenses that deter the caterpillar or attract, you know, wasps that will take care of the caterpillar. Yes, we talked about this a bit in episode 175 with Allie. These are defenses that turn on and they're common in plants, but they also are found in animals. And this can end up increasing cannibalism if a species is feeding on another species and the prey species turns on a defense and is now harder to eat, well, it now might be easier for the first species to start to cannibalize one another. Yes, because this species doesn't have defenses against its own species. Exactly. Japanese brown frogs, their tadpoles are prey for salamander larvae. Both, both are polyphenistic. They both have morphs. The salamander has cannibalistic and typical morphs. The tadpoles have normal morphs and defensive morphs. Some of the tadpoles will shift and develop bulkier bodies, thickening up their skin and becoming bigger on cues of salamander predators being around. The salamanders have a limited size to the how wide they can open their mouth, and these big tadpoles are too big to swallow. When this shift happens, the salamanders will then shift into the predatory morph, which has a bigger mouth, still not ideally sized for the bulky tadpoles, but now perfectly sized for other salamanders. <laughs> so they will shift into a cannibalistic mode when the tadpoles become uneatable. They can still eat the bulky tadpoles if they have to, but it is actually easier now to be cannibalistic. Another fun example I found with salamanders is back to tiger salamanders, which we mentioned 
in the first section. There's a, a study, at least was a, a got to poster. I don't know if it's uh, making its way to paper now, but looking into how climate change might affect cannibalistic morphs because they increase cannibalistic behavior when populations become denser, mm -hmm. which is often caused by pools drying. Many of these salamanders live in very seasonal pools that come from like melt water off of mountains and then slowly dry as you get into summer. And the females lay eggs in sequence with this cycle, but as the climate is shifting, these pools are drying up faster. Mm -hmm. And so it's been asked whether or not this will increase cannibalistic behavior in this species because the pool isn't lasting as long and the population becomes dense quicker. Yeah. They tested this by putting salamanders in different uh, uh, habitats with different treatments at low temperatures and increasing temperatures, as well as different densities of population. And they found something interesting. They did not find a difference in the number of cannibalistic morphs, but they did find what they put as cannibals disguised as typical morphs. Ah, uh, sneaky cannibals. Normal morph salamanders that were being cannibalistic. So they weren't morphing the same way. Yeah. And that the salamanders in the bins with higher temperatures and denser populations cannibalize each other more, even though they weren't morphing more. Yeah, that behavior was becoming more common. So environmental shifts have a huge effect and climate changes can have shifts in how the cannibalism presents itself yeah. in a species. A lot of research has been done on sexual cannibalism. Yep. Because it's so varied and it's so specific and there are some versions of it that it's hard to make sense of how that helps anyone. Right. How did that come about? Why is that happening? How is this beneficial really to either party? As with other cannibalism, it's likely that even though it is common within groups like spiders, it probably evolved multiple times in those different spiders. Sure. So it could almost be assumed that you have to treat each one as an individual case because who knows if they have a common ancestry. Some of these could be explained very easily as cases of mistaken identity. That sure. Sometimes females eat males because they are a small arthropod and they hunt small arthropods and the female just didn't notice it wasn't an insect. Right. These are spiders and praying mantises. Yeah. Animals that are very good at eating smaller invertebrates. So it could, a lot of the times, might just be something small enough to eat got close enough to eat, so they ate it and just didn't clock that it was their own species. One hypothesis for the others that seem to be much more purposeful or, or regular is parental investment, what we were talking about, that this could increase the chances and the success of that clutch of eggs. Mm -hmm. Either the male ensuring that they are the parent, that they're the ones fertilizing those eggs, or at least fertilizing more of them. There are a number, a number of situations where females are noted to have larger and more fit broods mm -hmm. after feeding on a male. Yep. So the parents that engage in this behavior are going to have lots of offspring and whatever genetic inheritable component there is to that behavior is liable to be present in all those babies. Exactly. There was one species was found that if the female feeds on the male, the eggs are more numerous and larger, you know, and, and, and more fit and healthy seemingly. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen if the female was fed a cricket instead of the male. Oh, so there's so something to... special about the male. Yes. So this is a, especially considered in instances where the male is complicit in the cannibalism as it was often described. Right. Which would make total sense that there is something nutritionally beneficial yes. about that species. Or that there is something directly beneficial to the male's furthering of its genetic lineage mm -hmm. by dying. This has often been considered for those situations. It's been criticized or not considered because there's lots of cannibalism that happens before mating. Yeah. Which this can't apply to at all. Yes. And there are other species. Uh, there's a number of groups that it's noted cannibalism boosts the eggs, but the males avoid it. Right. There's tons of groups, mantises and black widows and other jumping spiders and scorpions that have been found that if the female cannibalizes the male, the eggs do better. But the males are extremely cautious and avoidant of being cannibalized. Mm -hmm. So that kind of contradicts that that's why it's happening because it's beneficial to the male's 
parenthood. Right. It's beneficial to the female for yes. sure. But the males still would like to mate multiple times if they can. Right. And avoid giving that boost. So we might have contradicting selective pressures on males and females. Absolutely. This could be a very extreme form of sexual conflict, which is something that comes up. You know, famous examples like ducks, where you have kind of arms races between male and females in their reproductive strategies. That could be what's going on here. Some people have looked into trying to explain how the pre-mating cannibalism could be beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, for the female, it gives a meal. But if a female eats every male that approaches, that female goes unmated, which now is also ruining their chances of furthering their genetics. So how could that be beneficial evolutionarily? And many of them have looked at it as a from a point of view of female choice in mates. Right. That it might be a way for the female to be discerning of mates. Yeah, the same way that when there's a courtship display, the female, especially if the males are the one who are performing, females are selecting based on what is most appealing in that court. This is just a case where if you didn't do a good enough job, you get eaten. You get eaten. <laughs> and that's precisely it. Some spiders do have elaborate courtships, but for some, it might just be that the female considers the male. And if it's a big, strong, healthy looking male that would make good young... They mate. If it's a small male that wouldn't, doesn't have ideal looking genetics, then it's better as a meal. It is more useful to the female for that male to be a meal than instead of a mate. So it's just which value does the male have more as meal or mate? Another version of meal this. Or, meal or mate sounds like a reality TV <laughs> right? show. Right. This is uh, the spider <laughs> reality TV show. It's like The Bachelor, but the stakes are really high. <laughs> really high. Very short seasons. <laughs> The other version of that I found was called the economic model, where it's less about the condition of the male, but the condition of the environment. Sure. If there's plenty of prey to go around, then the female might be less likely to cannibalize because nutrition is readily available and it's better to ensure mm -hmm. that their eggs get fertilized. If prey is lower, then now the male might be more important as a emergency meal than as critical as a mate it might be more worth the risk to not get have a mate to have that meal and on the flip side if males are abundant mm. if chances to mate are abundant well then yeah Tip. eat all the males you want eat two or three <laughs> there will be a fourth <laughs> right if males are less common then that behavior may be diminished you they might need to be less cannibalistic because if the female eats the first two males, there might not be a third. That was all of them. There's you, and now those eggs don't get fertilized. Their genetics do not continue. There's also been hypotheses that it might be <laughs> not good for the adults. That it might be maladaptive from behaviors that were beneficial when they were younger. Mm. Aggression in female spiders is correlated with hunting success. Right. That if prey comes near, strike first, strike fast eat immediately, don't give it a chance to get away, that is going to promote successful hunts, which is going to promote growth. Bigger females produce more eggs and are typically going to be more healthy. So aggressive young females have a better chance at surviving and growing into healthy, large females later in life. And it may just be, this is a particular individual that is prone to eat anything that gets close. That's what has allowed it to become so successful. So it's going to end up eating a few males that come over to try to reproduce. And it might not just be particular individual, but if that aggression is tied genetically mm. to the spider, it might be that this species is beneficial to grow fast and grow effective young. But now you're stuck with that aggression. You've also selected for eating males now and then. Yes. And so it could be a feature that isn't actually helpful to the mating process. But it is helpful a, to other parts effect. of life yeah. that is now stuck around. There are tons of really cool studies into this stuff. Once again, put in your selections for a sexual cannibalism yes. episode. Because there's so many ins and outs and details of how to try to parse out which benefit is weighing most heavily in a single instance of sexual selection. The last cool category of cannibal evolution is protection from cannibalism mm -hmm. there are species that have not only developed cannibalistic individuals or morphs but ones that have adaptations in response to cannibalism being prevalent because while it is beneficial for that species for some to cannibalize and grow well 
the ones that aren't becoming cannibal morphs would like to not be cannibalized and still grow well. So there are interesting cases of a species evolution being directed by the cannibalism that happens. Cane toads, the famous invasive species in Australia, have shown a version of this likely due to the fact that in those invasive populations, the density of tadpoles can get extreme because there are not enough natural predators to keep the numbers down. It's been noted that in Australia, the tadpoles have started to show much more aggressive cannibalistic tendencies, especially toward weaker, less developed tadpoles in a pool. This is not seen in their native range in South America. This is not something that is as common or notably as regular as it is in these invasive, dense populations. The tadpoles have developed responses to try to avoid being cannibalized. One is rapid development before they become a toad and can start feeding. So they just develop faster. Right. You spend less time as that... Small, tad vulnerable tadpole. Yes. <laughs> you Because a big tadpole that's further along in development is going to target the ones who are early. Mm -hmm. So if you can develop fast and get out of being early, you might not get cannibalized. This developmental acceleration is also inducible. It is triggered by the presence of cannibalistic tadpoles. Interesting. So there seems to be an arms race between tadpoles only in these invasive populations. Yeah, they this have is... evolved these defenses against their own species. So the a rise in cannibalism has already been shown to have an effect on the developmental patterns of cane toad tadpoles in these new populations. But by far, the most famous of extreme cannibal behavior, shift, and response are locusts. Locusts are a type of grasshopper. Mm -hmm. They are typically just grasshoppers. Green, hopping around, eating plants, normal. But, and there's a couple different species that do this, but the desert locust is the one that you'll see mentioned most often, and I believe is the focus of most of the studies. When their populations are low, they behave normally and are solitary. As the population increases, though, there is a shift in both their anatomy and behavior. They transition into what is often called the gregarious phase, which is they stop avoiding each other and become attracted to each other, which then increases the density of the population, which speeds up the response. One paper I found said that they can go from solitary to fully gregarious behavior in two to four hours of forced crowding. So put into a suddenly dense population, within hours they shift from grasshopper to locust. This shift includes... Their behavior, they stop avoiding each other and start being drawn to one another. They also change color from green to yellow and black, mm -hmm. signaling that they taste bad and start becoming much more cannibalistic. They're still feeding mostly on plants, but they will take meat now and they are drawn to other members and will cannibalize those other members readily. Interesting. This has been noted to have a number of very interesting effects on the behavior and functioning of the famous locust swarms, all due to the locust trying to avoid being cannibalized. Uh, one that's very obvious is that they start to produce an anti-cannibal pheromone. <laughs> A compound starts to be produced by these young locusts, and they eventually will metamorphose into adults with wings and continue this locust march. But in crowded conditions, the nymphs will start to produce this pheromone that protects them from the more cannibalistic members in the group. And it was noted that both the production of this pheromone and degree of cannibalism increase with density of population. So it is a direct response to it in the same way that the cannibalistic behavior is. One of the famous things about locust swarms is that they form these massive, like, million locust groups that then march across landscapes and eventually fly across landscapes. Part of this movement is because they exhaust the food mm -hmm. where they are. They eat all the plants and they eat anything that didn't get out of their way and then they move on to a new area. But part of what drives the movement in a single direction is they are running from each other. Huh. The ones in front are running from the ones behind as well as moving toward the locusts in front. <laughs> so while one locust tries to cannibalize the one in front of it, it's trying to avoid the cannibal behind it. And that 
continues them in a single direction. The swarm chases itself across the landscape. Exactly. Weird. Part of that chasing is also that molting individuals are much more vulnerable, Mm -hmm. ones that are shedding their skin. So there is noted that there's also a phasic movement in the swarm between molting and non-molting individuals that they eat during the day and then they'll often find places to kind of settle at night and then move on. And that the cannibalistic non-molting individuals will leave the roost when it's time to go and start feeding again in the day while the ones that are about to molt stay at the roost. So they end up with these pockets of non-cannibalistic and ready-to-molt groups and they automatically separate themselves. They also know that ones that are close to molting will wait until the individuals around them are more fed because being more fed reduces cannibalistic behavior Mm -hmm. and then they can molt really quick while everyone's full. So cannibalistic behavior has had a ton of effects on the shifting morphs and overall behavior of the swarm. And it's been suggested that this shift might be an evolutionary response to cannibalistic behavior, that cannibalism increases in dense populations So locusts evolve to become a different kind of grasshopper that flees in a direction to keep that cannibalism level down and protect the species. Mm, That this is the behavior you need to exhibit in order to thrive and survive as a cannibalistic version of this animal. That you're an animal that displays cannibalism when the population gets too big. Mm -hmm. So that a defense of that is get better at being a big population. Yes. All of these other behaviors come along with those animals can't just keep doing all the same behaviors as before. Yes. Because now the, the structure and relationships between this with and within this swarm have changed. Yeah. And if you just stay put and keep trying to be normal caterpillars while cannibalic behavior ex- increases, yeah. your population might collapse. Grasshoppers. Grasshoppers. That's right. Yep. <laughs> uh Which means that the giant plague level locust swarms that we know could be an evolutionary, due to an evolutionary response to normal cannibalistic behavior Mm -hmm. that shows up in a lot of dense populations of lots of insects. This one responded by becoming a mobile swarm to keep the population moving and reduce the threat of cannibalism. So like, all the famines that have been caused by that, the predators <laughs> that feed off of these swarms, all could come back to cannibalism. Yeah. It's a it's hugely studied because of this. That is fascinating. Right? And with that, that is by no means all there is to say about cannibalism. <laughs> there are so many cool examples I had to just not really mention. <laughs> Check out the blog post. We will have links for more stuff. All this talk about the variation of cannibalisms and the different situations where it comes into play makes me picture a very unlikely but hypothetically possible species of like spider or something where the female would eat the male and then give birth and then the young would eat the female and then the young would eat each other (laughs) and only one member of the family survives (laughs) and goes on to go reproduce again yep yep (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's it gets very intense in some of them as to like, to me, it really drives home how critical survival can be. Yeah. And what ex- seemingly extreme behaviors come from it. Well, and this is a fun discussion, both from the standpoint of here's a thing that you have, many of us have been led to believe is rare or unusual or abnormal. And it isn't that. Here's all this incredible diversity. Yeah. But this is one of those topics that can strain our understanding of natural selection. Yes. Because we understand the behaviors of organisms in the light of natural selection. And a lot of the stuff we typically talk about makes a lot of intuitive sense as to, yeah, these structures, these behaviors all have a clear selective benefit, usually multiple clear selective benefits. You can understand why genetically this becomes prevalent inherited more and more often these kinds of behaviors lead to really interesting discussions about natural selective processes because it isn't quite as intuitive because they tend to be at the crossroads of many different selective pressures and sometimes competing selective pressures yes and this behavior is the outcome of that interplay of all the different things that are 
contributing to success in a lineage. And then we get to have all these fun theoretical discussions of course. What what is the mess of selective pressures that have come together to create this type of behavior? Yes, precisely. And now in the future, when you watch a documentary and they have that dramatic moment go where the, this animal is a cannibal, you can go, why are you making a point to point that out? Yeah, who isn't? Yeah, that's not that weird. <laughs> Tell me why. And that's the interesting yes. question. <laughs> Before we wrap up entirely, we have one last section which is our patron question. One of the benefits our patrons get at certain levels is to ask us questions that we answer here on the podcast. So every episode we pick one and answer it. What's our question today? This episode's question comes from Kylie, who asks, Why do tetrapod species keep evolving less digits, fingers and toes, but never evolve more than five, despite the fact that genetic mutations causing polydactyly, extra fingers, are present in a number of different species? Very good question. And yes, we see tons of groups where reducing digits is a very, it's a very common thing to happen. And many groups kind of trend that way. Horses are the famous one. Mm -hmm. They started with multiple toes and reduced down to a single toe. Yeah, the earliest land vertebrates had several digits on each hand. Eventually that sort of settled at the common number of five. And since then we have seen many lineages of descendants reduce down to four or three or two or one. Sometimes different numbers on the front and back yeah. limbs. Dogs are famous for that. Gators and crocs are famous for that. Like reducing digits is seemingly a very common and supposedly easy thing to evolve. Mm-hmm. And there's lots of reasons this could happen. Running species often do this because having more digits in the way can actually complicate and raise your chance for injury. So selecting down to a single strong digit. It streamlines that limb. Yep. But extra digits is a thing that tends not to evolve. Which for lots of features, when something's evolved away, it is not expected to evolve back because that's not really how evolution works. Mm -hmm. That it's just going to come back because it could be useful or would be useful. It's been lost. It is no longer in the genetics, or at least not enough of it is for that group to have it anymore. For many features, that's the norm and we expect it. But Kylie points out very accurately that this is a situation where due to genetic situations, individuals can be born with an extra a copy of one of their digits yes an extra finger an extra toe this happens in humans yes and it happens in tons of other species cats are famous for this and so that does lead to a question of well there is a it's not re-evolving it that is a genetic duplicate but that can be heritable a parent mm-hmm. can pass that down to an offspring So why have we not seen that result in the regaining of a digit in a species? Six-fingered lineages moving forward with this inheritable mutation. Yes, if that extra digit does give some benefit, and if it is advantageous to the survival of that group, why wouldn't it lead to a splitting? And I'd assume there's a couple of potential reasons I can think of for that happening. One is that it might not be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like cats, uh, the mitten cats, and there's another term for them, uh, that get the multiple digits, those often can be problematic. Uh, You can get claws that aren't fully attached to the rest of the paw, uh, that don't have bones attaching them, and that can get caught or infected or uh, uh, grow without being able to be shed. So it might not be adaptive. It might be a detriment to a species that gets an extra digit. And the other big part of it is... If, for instance, a person with six fingers has a child with a person with five fingers, then it the that trait might just get re-lost. Mm-hmm. It might not persist. And so unless that individual can, f- unless that trait is dominant enough to keep showing up, or they find another individual who has the trait, it just might not be able to persist. Just statistically, you're, it's not likely for there to be enough chance for it to happen. Yeah. My, my go-to answer would be very simply that it, even though it doesn't seem like it, that's a big change. It is a very big change. Uh, natural selection doesn't work very well with big changes. There are examples in animals where we have seen a, quote, extra digit 
evolve. Yes. Uh, pandas are the famous example. Both giant pandas and red pandas have done this, where they have evolved kind of an extra thumb, but it's not a finger. It is a wrist bone. It's a, it's a sesamoid, I believe, that over time developed into more and more of a prominent structure. That was a gradual, bit by bit, small changes in increments along the way, development of a new functional digit. The kind of mutation that causes polydactyly, that causes a sixth toe or whatever, is a duplication of that full developmental process, and it's a whole extra digit Yes, all at once, which means even if it did provide some sort of benefit to that animal, it is almost certainly going to come along with complications. Yes. That isn't something that was able to develop gradually over many generations and be tweaked and adjusted and refined by natural selection along the way. That's a whole extra thing now. Yes. Like if uh, every now and then we'll see animals that have an extra limb or an mm -hmm. extra head, that's the rest of the anatomy is not suited to supporting that. Yeah, it's not adapted to have that extra uh, right. uh, body part. Which is why we see the gradual development of that extra digit in pandas but the repeated loss of that mutation of the extra digit in other animals. This is the same thing that's true. We've talked about this about things like teeth, episode yes. 88. There are many lineages of animals that go back and forth over their evolution from more teeth and fewer teeth and more teeth, and that is almost exclusively in animals with very simple teeth. Exactly. In mammals who have very complex tooth structure, it almost always goes one direction. Mm -hmm. Mammals reduce their tooth count, but do not add more teeth because that's a complex structure. It is possible for a genetic quirk to throw an extra molar in there or throw an extra finger on, but that is not likely to be well enough adapted to then stick around, to be stable, yes. either genetically or behaviorally in that lineage. Well, on the example of teeth, if humans, us, us, have too many teeth, we have to go get surgery. Right, because <laughs> we go to the dentist. our mouth can only fit so many, and it will start to cause problems with the rest of our teeth because it's now fighting for space. A digit is a fairly complex structure, and even if it doesn't have any immediate medical downsides, it is still a very big adjustment of the typical body plan. Now, I know that long-term listeners are sitting out there saying, what about ichthyosaurs? Yes. Because we talked in episode 116 about how ichthyosaurs, there are many species that are polydactyl, that have extra digits effectively in their flippers. And that seems like a case where they're getting away with it because that isn't an extra digit. No. It's an extra row of bones that is contributing to the shape of the flipper, which is probably why that's able to stick around, because that is functionally less of a dramatic change and it can be something that happens one bone at a time or a little bit at a time yes that arguably also is unlikely to have happened as just a whole extra digit showed up yeah that could easily have been an incremental shift that helped to structure that flipper that they're using absolutely like we could breed a polydactyl lineage of an animal that that shows that that mutation and like if a group of people decided that they were going to form a commune of polydactyl people it could happen but very much like when we breed dogs that often would form and show up with other issues because now you're starting with a very small population it is not a common occurrence so maybe with a species where it happened more regularly you know if it was a particularly easy mutation to happen with that species it would be more likely to potentially happen. But yeah, there's just a lot of other evolutionary trends kind of working against it sticking around. So yeah, very good question. And and bottom line, we don't fully know why. Yes, this is theoretical, <laughs> yes. but I do I think that these are reasonable explanations for that trend. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that question, Kylie. Good question. Thank you. If any of you would like to ask us fun questions like that, you can sign up for our Patreon where we you can submit cool questions for us to answer. You'll find links for that down in the description. You'll also find a link to the blog post, which has the links and pictures about this episode. Don't forget to keep an ear out for Spotlight, 
which is coming out soon. Yep, second episode comes out very shortly after this one. And then later in April, Silver Screen Science is coming back. Keep your ears out for that. We'll be talking about movies. And then we're going to do a live stream yeah. for our Silver Screen Science discussion. So join us for that. And as always, thank you to all of you who requested this topic and to our new patrons. Special extra thanks to our top tier patrons, Sarah May, Daniel the Bug Lover, Robert Mart, and Melissa Barksdale. And with that, uh, we we can wrap up this episode. This is it. Time for dinner. Time for I am getting hungry, uh, <laughs> this ironically is, enough. This has been an episode, th- one of the top episodes that I have had to spend the whole of the discussion being very mindful of the kind of jokes that I am thinking of. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> being very mindful not to make it a little too gross or a little too... <laughs> this is one of those topics that butts right up against certain human behaviors. Yes. And so we, we want to be very mindful that we're not leaning into particular portrayals of these behaviors. Yes, stereotypes and, and mindsets that might not be ideal. Yes. But it's funny sometimes and it's hard not to <laughs> want and, and now I'm hungry. Now yes, it's time yeah. to go get some food. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.